Hello everyone, my name is, is Jorge Mestre Ferrandi. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Voy a hacer dos líneas en, en castellano y luego voy a pasar a inglés eh, por Leticia. Es un honor y un placer eh, estar aquí hoy con, con vosotros en esta sesión abierta, esta sesión de, de formación con, con Leticia Smith eh, sobre una herramienta para el manejo de incertidumbre en la priorización de, de investigación en salud. Uh, now I'm going to change to... Y gracias a eso, obviamente, por, por invitarme y a, y a Leticia por, por aceptar eh, la invitación. Entonces, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, a short biography from Leticia. I don't know if you know, if you know, you know her already, but, but then I, I'm very briefly. So she joined the, the team for economic evaluation and health technology assessment at the Center for Health Economics at the University of York back in September 2017 and previously worked as a research fellow at the Academic Unit of Health Economics at the University of Leeds. She holds a PhD in Health Economics and an MSc in Environmental Economics from the University of York. And before joining academia, she graduated with an MSc in Management and Finance from Grenoble Graduate Business School in France and worked in, a, in the asset management industry for two years as well as an investment banking. That sounds really interesting. Um, but we, not, not about the topic today. Her PhD research has been funded by the ESRC and is focused on methods to improve the evaluation of the health benefits and cost effectiveness of improvements in, in air quality. She has also done some work in, in economic models to support cost effectiveness appraisals and applied to public health policies, such as, our, such as air pollution control and smoking prevention. Today, what she's going to, to talk about, um, oh, well, of course, she, she provides technical support and guidance across a number of healthcare technology segments for NICE and supports the Department of Health Policy Research Unit in Economic Evaluation. So she knows, she certainly knows about economic evaluation. She, and, and finally, she has been um, keen interest in value of information methods and their application to support healthcare resource allocation in low and middle income countries. And this is what she's going to, to talk today uh, about, uh, the Tansi Laonse program grant that she's currently developing uh, a tool uh, to support local decision makers in evaluating the value of undertaking further research when designing health, bene health benefit packages. Because ultimately as economists, we need to help decision makers how to prioritize our limited resources. And I think uh, Leticia's tool and with her team is trying to precisely do that, support decision makers um, to, to decide where to, where to spend the money. Of course, dealing with uncertainty, which we know is, is critical. So with that, I am going to pass on enough for me. I'm going to stop my video as well. So, and then Leticia, you can um, start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge, for your excellent introduction. I'm going to share my screen and we can kick start it because I think we are running a bit out of time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you all see my slides, I suppose so. If no one complains, I carry on. <laughs> so, yeah, as Hoga said, the idea is um, to develop methods and also tools to help uh, the design of packages of high care interventions. The tool was, was developed uh, with a focus in low and middle income countries, but it could really be used as well for any institutions in, your, in developed countries that prioritize research. So all this research called Living Center, like the NetCC in the UK and so forth. But I'll talk more about this in a bit. Um, so in terms of overview today, I will obviously uh, first spend quite a bit of time on the decision context so you know, so you understand why this tool was developed. I will first define briefly what I mean by these healthcare intervention packages how they are informed or at least should be informed. And then I will move on to the decision-making implication of uncertainty in evidence base. And also briefly uh, talk about the typical approach that is currently used to allocate uh, research funds uh, by research coordinating centers. After all of this um, <clears throat> introduction on the decision context, I will then move on to uh, the methods and then the tool that was designed to support uh, these packages of intervention. So then I will uh, basically briefly show you uh, how to input the data in the, um, and upload the data into the tool. And uh, we were gonna see what kind of results you might get. 
And finally, after that, um, I will obviously go over some important considerations to bear in mind um, as to how to contextualize results. All right. So these healthcare intervention packages, what are they aimed at? The main thing is often they are uh, designed to address broad health indications. For instance, how to best address um, the obesity issue or cardiovascular conditions or depression and so forth. Basically, you have a clear objective, funding allocated to it, and you want to basically define the best way of achieving this objective, meaning what kind of interventions you should put it, uh, you should fund to be able to achieve and, for instance, reduce the uh, uh, obesity burden. And that's for more, uh, that's uh, in developed country. In uh, low and middle income countries, often these packages are aimed to support the implementation of universal health coverage. But it's always the same idea. Uh, in developed country, you might have a more focused objective. So as I said, obesity or reducing cardiovascular conditions. In low and middle income country, it will be wider, but the idea is to try to optimize, um, basically to make sure that you include, uh, that you fund intervention that will generate the most population health given limited and often highly limited resources. All right, so this really, the, the idea is efficiency basically in resource allocation. And like anything uh, that requires efficiency, you need a rational evidence-based approach to try to achieve it. And in the, care, in the case of um, healthcare decision-making, I think uh, there have been quite a lot of literature on that. The key uh, things to take into account of, obviously the scale of the health benefits to be generated. So obviously how many individual would uh, benefit from the intervention, so then how much yeah, benefit could be generated, and the health opportunity costs that derive by funding a given intervention. As I said, the resource envelope is often highly limited, so you know that if you allocate your funds to a given intervention, you automatically reduce funds to others. And in doing that, you obviously reduce the health that could be generated by other interventions. So you always have to take into account that, that whatever you do, whenever you allocate resources somewhere, there is an opportunity cost to that. Ideally, this opportunity cost should be informed by the marginal productivity of the healthcare system, obviously, because so then you know exactly by uh, using the funds, you know exactly how much health you might remove out of the system. Uh, that's the theory. There are ways, obviously, to estimate that, and in the, health, in the low and middle income countries, you can use more pragmatic approaches. But the idea is that that you need to take into account scales of health benefits and the fact that there is an opportunity cost in when you allocate your resources, and this opportunity cost can be converted into health because with this money you could invest into all the healthcare interventions that, in turn, would generate health. So these um, two components are taken into account um, by the population net health effect met metrics that I think most or some of you will have come across. Uh, it's also the net health benefits, but yeah, now the new wording is population net health effects. And the idea is that you can, um, the, the first step is obviously to determine the incremental cost and incremental benefits of interventions that you're looking at against a comparator. In our case, I use do nothing. And then you express this incremental cost into unit of health that will be foregone elsewhere using these estimates of health opportunity cost, right? And when you do that, then you can basically, everything, it becomes expressed into health, health gain on one side, health foregone on the other side, that are the equivalent of the incremental cost, and that's how you reach the net health effect. And this is typically measured, so in developed countries, it will be quality gain. In uh, low and middle income countries, it will be daily averted. But then through these metrics, the decision rule um, to inform whether to invest or not into uh, an intervention is very straightforward because if this population net health effect is positive, so basically you know that you will generate more health than the health that you will take out on, in the system 
by paying for the interventions, then you say that the intervention is cost effective. And conversely, if the population net health effect is negative, then it's because the opportunity cost associated by funding interventions are too high. It's a bit like, you can say it's unaffordable, then the intervention is not cost effective. Now, the one issue is that um, the elements to, that to estimate this population net health effect are uncertain. So um, I will not spend focus on this issue about the measure of the health opportunity cost. I assume that it is known, more or less, uh, same for the size of the targeted population. But the issue is that the incremental cost and the incremental health benefits often are not, they won't be known uh, with certainty simply because the epidemiological, clinical, and economic data that underpin the quantification are themselves uncertain. We never know for sure. I mean, there's uncertainty around the baseline prevalence of the disease that interventions aim to, to address about the impact um, on quality of life, about the effect size, you know, the clinical effectiveness of the intervention, and so forth and so on. So there is uncertainty around this population that has effects. So what we have is a distribution. All right, at the end, we just what we really have is sizes of effects and that we can link with some um, expected likelihood. All right, that's what creates this probability distribution. And when we synthesize that, we kind of get our best guess, what we think might happen, but we, we, really, we don't know whether that's gonna happen uh, once we implement the intervention. This probability, this probability distribution around, of this population net health effect is however very valuable because it tells us two things. First, obviously how likely we might take an investment decision that is incorrect. By incorrect, it means that we end up investing and actually it turns out the opportunity costs are too great. And when we look at the net health effects, we end up with a loss. Or conversely, that we exclude an intervention while it turns out we would have had, it would have generated positive net health effects. And it also tells us how much health we might lose out. So the consequences of like taking a wrong decision. And this is shown um, in the example below. So we have two interventions. So intervention A, we can see that, um, so for both interventions, we're uncertain about the size of the effect, about exactly how much net health effect we might get. However, for intervention A, you think, okay, but even in the best scenarios, I still end up with negative, uh, negative effect. So it looks like, Although we're uncertain about the size of the effects, we are pretty certain that it's an intervention that is unaffordable for the, for the system, for the healthcare system. For intervention B, that's quite different because clearly, so the best guess is above zero. I don't know if you managed it with the arrow. So it looks like we expect um, that the intervention would generate a, a positive net health gain and that we should invest in it. However, we can see that there are quite, um, there's quite a non-negligible probability that we get it wrong. And also the loss, the losses associated with getting it wrong are not so small. So um, the whole idea of, of understanding, of quantifying the value of research and especially within the value of information framework is to then translate these expected losses into the benefits that research could generate. Because if you think, especially in an expected, um, if you assume perfect information so that you would know exactly the true effect, you would really avoid all of those losses through research. And so that's why you kind of think, okay, research could really help me by weighting those expected losses uh, with the likelihood. You can reach an estimate of how much health research could generate. But this is, this is a maximum, but that's already a very useful starting value. Okay. So, um, checking how long is time. Okay. Um, and just before moving on to the tool, so now you had the Python theory, 
what is happening, uh, at least so far, that research coordinating center, so in particular, so that the, the, net C, uh, the NET SCC in the UK, so which is a body from the NHR, National Institute for Health Research, or PICOR in the US, so Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and uh, as well as health ministries uh, in the middle income countries, often. Um, rely on structured deliberations of a panel of experts to either establish research agenda or decide how to allocate research funds. But those deliberations are typically informed by qualitative assessments. So of several criteria, but that include obviously evidence needs because they might go through a grading of evidence quality. They might identify whether evidence gap on efficacy but what has come up so far is that uncertainty around cost effectiveness and whether uncertainty around efficacy would translate to uncertainty around cost effectiveness, meaning uncertainty around this population net health effect that I just talked about, is not considered. And as a result, there is no quantitative estimates of um, where research could make the largest contribution that are no, none of these estimates are computed, are even asked for, and basically none of them are used to inform deliberation. And the idea here is to try at least um, to inform deliberation with some um, estimate that can be computed in a systematic manner, and that could be comparable. I mean, the approach could be comparable across interventions. So, Indeed, so what um, we, we aim to propose uh, is, um, to help implement with the tool is to design, to support the design of those packages of intervention, and at the same time, to guide the allocation of research funds, because they all work together. If you, if you make sure that research funds are targeted to where there are really evidence gap regarding cost effectiveness, you can really improve the future design of packages. That's the whole idea. And so to do that, um, yeah, you need to identify interventions or investment decisions, the same for which research would generate the most population health. This approach, and I will explain uh, also why, um, and the idea is to also propose a timely and straightforward implementation of this approach in the context that we're in, uh, in the context of uh, this research coordinating center that typically only have uh, secondary evidence. And I will then um, illustrate the framework and the tool uh, using the case of the health benefits package for Malawi. So that's what we proposed. And so we propose to implement this systematic approach in a particular decision context where we don't have um, access to cost effectiveness model, but only access to secondary evidence, which is the case typically of uh, this research coordinating center. So they use um, data from published cost effectiveness studies. And these studies, they do not uh, receive reports directly uh, probability distribution of net health effect. It would be too easy. However, they do report sensitivity analysis results. And from and this sensitivity analysis result help us inform the variation in expected incremental costs and incremental benefits. And the whole idea of the tool is to try to extract as much information that we can from this kind of sensitivity analysis output, so we can finally derive this probability distribution of population that has effect, and then implement our approach where we link together potential losses and the likelihood with the health benefits of research. So I'm sure you all came across this. Um, I'm gonna go briefly, but yeah, the, the type of sensitivity analysis that uh, might be reported in published cost effectiveness studies um, vary greatly, but different medium might be used. So you have the traditional uh, tornado plots uh, that is used to report results from univariate sensitivity analysis. So where you have parameters that typically take a low and high value and you report the impacts in terms of uh, on incremental costs, incremental benefits, or in, on the ISO, whichever. Then some studies report um, a histogram of ISO 
or um, scatter plots of the simulations of incremental benefits and incremental costs, or simply or um, alternatively, the report probability of interventions being cost effective. So there are many different ways in reporting results of uh, sensitivity analysis results. And as it stands, it's, it's very difficult to, to make the link from this to estimates of the value of research. Oops. Ah, I didn't, <laughs> anyway. And that's the whole idea. That's the whole idea of the tool. So yeah, as I said before, you extract this information so you, you're able to simulate incremental cost and incremental health benefits to fit distributions to them, to correlate them. And you get this, uh, I'm gonna take this more, the population net health effect distribution. That's why you really ask. Um, but yeah, doing this requires uh, statistical knowledge and is computationally intensive, partly because of the diversity of the outputs and um, in the way this information can be reported. So the idea of the tool is to address these two barriers. And I'm going to show that in a minute. Um, I will ju I'll just now provide you quickly um, with the overall uh, representation of how to interact with the tool. So the whole idea is that the end user can just collate all this information into a single um, data file, which is an Excel file that normally everyone has access to. So there are two key, uh, two types of key components to enter. The first thing are called decision analytic parameters. So there are this measure of health opportunity cost that are key to convert these famous incremental cost into the net, uh, into the health uh, foregone by funding an intervention. So then I can compute this net health effect matrix. The time horizon during which we think the interventions will be implemented, because obviously that's a key driver of the overall benefits that will be generated and the discount rate. So these are traditional, let's say, uh, parameters to, uh, to inform when you do any type of economic evaluation. And in addition, the second type of parameter consists of, so this best guess or this mean of uh, incremental cost and incremental health benefits, which is typically used, uh, this is typically available, uh, the target population size, and then this, the output of sensitivity analysis that help inform the variation on incremental cost and incremental benefits. And the tool can handle so most of the, sensitivity analysis outputs that can be found in the literature. That includes, so as you saw before, tornado plots, um, even if you have the raw simulations, uh, but that's unlikely, but the tool can still handle that. Uh, scatter plots, uh, this cost effectiveness, ac acceptability curves, distribution advisors, um, standard errors, or confidence interval. So um, the whole idea is that yeah, all of the information available gets collected here. And then the tool um, will just produce, based on that, we just produce this distribution of population and health effects, and then the health benefits of research. And the tool can be downloaded. Uh, I think it might be working, but I don't want maybe. Yeah, it's working. Anyway, on, on, on our website. Okay. And before, um, just to give you a bit introduction of the case study that I use uh, to implement the tool. So as I mentioned before, it was the health benefits package for the health ministry of Malawi. They had um, a total of 67 interventions that they considered uh, for the package, so to, in to include within the package. And but for only 21 of them, there were data um, sensitivity analysis data available. So the tool can also address when you don't have any sensitivity analysis data. And I'm happy to talk about that uh, later. But for this purpose, I, I just focused on the, the cases when I had the data. And it's, it's just to show how, um, how diverse it was. So some were univariates, I had some tornado plots. Sometimes I even got a raw simulation from study author. Uh, ISO histogram, say uh, confidence interval and stuff like that. It, it was quite, it was quite bad. All right, so now I will um, give you a brief demo of the tool. 
I just show you first the input data file, what I mean. Um, that got created. All of this can be downloaded uh, on the site, the full package. So here, that's where you enter the key, uh, this decision analytic parameters. This has opportunity cost, the time period, this comes right. And this is more for graphical setting. So all the, um, the tool also, I forgot to mention, but any, you can click and uh, you get a link to all the user, uh, the, the user guides. No, exactly on the right section. So this is, uh, there's quite an extensive user guide that accompany the tool and as well as technical appendices. So, but anyway, going back. So you entered, uh, you, end user will enter the decision analytic parameter. And then on each uh, spreadsheet, he can enter the data that he, she has. Not all spreadsheets obviously needs to be filled in. You can even run it for a single intervention. That's not a problem. But the idea is, so for univariate analysis, is, um, the idea is to enter the value of the parameters that are valid, these input parameters. That could be, for instance, uh, uh, mortality rates. And then the idea is to see, so that varies, what is the, uh, the impact of varying this parameter in terms of incremental health benefits, and incremental cost. And this is what is reported on the tornado plot. So the idea is simply to read out the tornado plot and to enter those values. There is no other way. I mean, still, that's the bit that, um, that people have to do, but it's um, everyone can do that basically. It's just about reading a graph and reporting the values depicted by a graph. Uh, what is important also in this case is to report whether the input parameter is a rate, a proportion, a cost, and so forth. So then the right distributions are fitted to those parameters. Uh, but you can also enter directly uh, row simulation values. Uh, for the scatter plot, so that's just to give you an example, you enter, the whole idea is simply to think, okay, what is the minimum and maximum value for incremental has benefits and incremental costs? That is depicted in my scatter plot. And what seems to be the correlation? So this again, the user guide explain how you really can read it out. But in this case, you can see that it's pretty strong and pretty negative. Give it a that. And so a value of minus 0 0.7 was given. So um, for the ICER, again, it's simply to read out. So this is a bit, I would say, maybe perhaps tedious, uh, but there is no other way. Otherwise, it would have been a super fancy tool that scans every different pictures and managed to read out. And still, I think it would have been difficult to implement. So again, you read out your histogram and you think, okay, what is the frequency or probability associated with each different values? And you just enter them. That's as simple as that. What I didn't mention, obviously, you need to enter an intervention ID to each different intervention. So for instance, in summary, you, you, you enter an ID from one to the total number of intervention. So then the tool know, how, can link back the interventions in terms of the best guesses that you enter here and the sensitivity analysis that you enter there. That, that's as that. And if you want, uh, you just copy paste and you enter more intervention, as many as you want. Uh, for the SEAC, same, the idea is just read out the SEAC, you enter the probability of being cost effective associated with different willingness to pay value. And again, this is the intervention ID. That, uh, and again, confidence interval, you entered um, the lower and the upper bounds for incremental health benefits and incremental costs that are typically that will be reported in studies if they run a sensitivity analysis or you can might just report the standard there. All right, so again, you can just have information for the single interventions. You, not all spreadsheets needs to be filled in. And um, this is just run a series of checks to make sure that you can upload the, the file. All right, we're running out of time, so. I'm gonna now show you how it works with the tool. So I'm gonna launch the tool. <clears throat> the only slight issue is that you have to be a bit patient. It takes a few seconds to load. So you have to sometimes stare at the, at the screen. 
All right, it's not even that slow, it's okay. So he's talking to you a little bit, telling you, okay, please upload data file. And then he's telling you what it does, so you don't get bored too long. And just to confirm, Leticia, we're still all here listening to you while it's uploading. All right, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I know sometimes it's a bit, it's a bit, I'm still here, don't worry. We're listening <laughs> to you. I mean, I'm going to leave my camera for now, just to give you a bit more energy to see that some people are listening to you. All right. <laughs> While, you are, while you're loading the, the screen. Thanks. Look, it's screen. already done. It's oh, you see? Right, nearly there, nearly there. <laughs> all right. So basically then once you process uh, all, the inter uh, all the information, it tells you, okay, where do you want me to load? And you just tell him what you want to do. And while it's loading, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to put it in the chat up. I don't think we're going to have time because we have to finish probably at 6.30, but at least Leticia could have the comments or questions in, in the chat and we can make sure there's any follow-up if anybody wants to, to discuss. So just to flag as well. No, Leticia, you were saying that maybe, you know, it looks tedious just to have to populate the model, but I think just thinking you don't need to uh, run a probabilistic sensitivity analysis or you need a model already existing, you know, for me, this is just fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the whole idea, especially once, if you do it a lot, then you become good at it. It's just, yeah, you still need to do that, like enter the data that you have. But yeah, the, the, the model that's, yeah, you have, a, I think uh, I have 1,000, more than 2,000 lines of code that does all the rest for you. So then uh, it's, but yeah, still, you, you have to then, yeah, read the graph. Um, so that's the output that gets created. So you get the summary results, um, what you put it in, and what the tool computed for the incremental health benefits per person. Because I went a bit fast, but in the input data file, the idea is you just put the results as they're reported in the study. And you obviously tell uh, the tool what is the population size, so then the tool can then convert back to result per person. But like that, because otherwise it would be very difficult for the end user to start when he she enters result from the sensitivity analysis result to already do the conversion. So that's uh, that's also done by, by the tool to convert per person. Sorry, I mean, and for a certain currency. Um, yeah, this I will go quickly. Basically, the tool allows you. Um, can compute uncertainty and certainty range even if you don't have any data by borrowing information from the intervention for which you have data. And that's why I call scenario based. Obviously, it's much more uncertain because you assumed that basically the mean, and it depends what kind of intervention you, you enter. But if they are similar, that could work. Okay, basically, you looked at the mean uh, variation in incremental costs and incremental health benefits in those studies for which you have data. And he uses it um, to, be, uh, to derive variation around cost and benefits for those studies that you don't have data. That's what he means by scenario based. Um, I'm going to go rather and focus on the graphs because, I mean, the, given, yeah, the, for the sake of time, I think um, there are two things. The, um, the graph shows you first um, uh, classical, uh, what they call book bookshelves. A graph of incremental health benefits and net health effects, and the whole idea is to show how much, um, how is, how it's important to look at the opportunity cost of funds and not just focus on the overall benefits. So, for instance, you think, oh, um, some interventions is very good, like uh, so forty-two. You might not see it's very small, but it's uh, pediatric ART. Uh, so, on uh, antiretroviral treatments. Um, in this case, okay, I'm not, it might not be politically acceptable, but in this case, you think, okay, um, the benefits are high, but when you look at the net health effect, you're like, oh, okay, but this intervention is not affordable. So this is basically the metrics to look at, to inform uh, investment decisions that shape uh, package design, that really decide, okay, um, which, which intervention we should include or not. Um, and similarly, it shows that if you just look, and as is currently the case, I think if you just look at gap, or let's say um, 
So a gap in efficacy or the amount of uncertainty around efficacy, that might be a poor predictor of uncertainty around cost effectiveness. And this is what should drive research because at the end of the day, we want to know um, package design is informed by cost effectiveness uh, metrics. So if you look at these first two interventions, the uncertainty around the PKC is quite large, is uh, providing TB treatment, so a treatment for tuberculosis. But when you look at the net health effects, you can see that the range is really in the positive values. So you're like, okay, even if we are uncertain, we are kind of pretty certain that, again, given the decision context, meaning the time horizon, the discount rate used, and the health opportunity cost estimate that we used, these interventions are, uh, will be cost effective, will provide a net health effect or value for money, whichever you want to express it. So that's the whole idea, that's to, to be able to realize um, how we might take different research decisions by looking on like uncertainty around efficacy versus uncertainty around net health effect, meaning around cost effectiveness. And the whole, um, and this is, so basically the, the, that's the key thing that the tool does. It, it doesn't, it computes this probability distribution that is here just reported um, with the mean and the 95% confidence interval. And based on that, we can see for which intervention there is uncertainty and that those for which this error bar goes from net health effect to net health losses because it shows that, oh, in that case, we, we're not sure whether we should really invest into the intervention. And that the case, you might not see it because some are really small. For eight intervention out of the 21 that I looked at. And then the whole idea is to try to think, okay, now I know that there are eight interventions that are uncertain for which the investment decision is uncertain, but for which do I really want, or shall we really focus research efforts on, meaning for which of those interventions, reducing uncertainty would produce the most population health? That's, um, and, and that's a question that the tools aims to answer. And that's uh, some answers are provided in this graph. And you can see in this case, that is pretty clear cut that out of these eight interventions, there are three, for which they would uh, undertaking research would generate, could, not would, but could generate uh, potentially high uh, benefits. I said could because obviously um, it depends then on the study design and so forth. Um, and these interventions are male circumcision, uh, community management of um, acute malnutrition, and this is um, another therapy, uh, is an preventive therapy. Um, I will skip this. Um, the tools provide many more outputs, basically, uh, including uh, correlation values, standard errors, and some validity checks. And why, uh, so then why you might expect differences uh, between validity check between the mean input that you entered and the mean input created by the tool from simulation. So then clearly first is to rule out sometimes a user could potentially enter the wrong uh, data or enter the data consistently. So this could get picked up quickly or sometimes to just highlight inconsistency within studies. In some cases, I had quite a large difference between results from probability sensitivity analysis that uh, provided, uh, for instance, this ISO histogram and uh, from deterministic analysis. So obviously, there are going to be also uh, differences uh, in the two. Anyway, that's, the, that's just to get you, give you a feel. There is much more to it. But I will just close, go back quickly to the slide, and then we might have a few more minutes. Um, what did I want to say again? And then I stopped talking. Uh, uh, in terms of the contextualized findings, it's important still to know, obviously, uh, that all of this is as good still as the data that you put in. So it's always important that uh, the evidence used goes through a process of critique and refinement. Um, no, I mean, that might sound obvious, but yeah, so then we'll make sure that the evidence is generalizable and that the data 
used is relevant to today's world. That's more, I think that's more relevant for low and middle income country context, where sometimes studies are very old. But yeah, that's something I wanted to mention that the tool used the results that are reported in the studies. We still need to use our judgment to think, okay, whether these results are still relevant to today's world. So that's, that's. Uh, the findings will be obviously sensitive to some assumptions that are taken in the tool. As you are aware, I skip completely all the <laughs> all the parts on the on the statistics methods that I use behind the scene. Um, but there are some assumptions that are taken, and these are not statistical assumptions. Is when, for instance, I just get we just get ISA data, which is really um, uh, let's say annoying because you lose a lot of information by just getting uh, a ratio by just getting a ratio. So then we had uh, in some case to have to impose bounds on uh, incremental health benefits, mini minimum and maximum values. So again, this uh, the end user can change that, but there are values that are used by default, and obviously findings will be sensitive to that. Uh, same for correlation values. So um, the tool try to do as much as possible, but obviously when there are some data gaps, assumptions are taken and findings will be sensitive to them. I think that that's the key message. Um, but um, yeah, having this in mind, I think the whole idea is to then of the tool is to try to uh, identify, to help really identify where research could contribute the most in improving uh, decision decision making regarding uh, packages of intervention. And um, so in, in the case of a developing country, it can help in the negotiation or in the, it can help as a basis for communication between research funders and uh, health ministries. And in more developed country, um, so if you think of the NETCC in the UK or people in the US, this kind of estimates can really help identify research priorities among the various recommendations for research that this institute research, uh, receive, because this institute tend to receive a lot of uh, different, uh, let's say, suggestions for research from various stakeholders that could be in the UK, the NICE clinical guidance groups or clinical trial units. And it's good if you then, if, if each of them could at least have some qualitative estimates of the value of research, it would make things much easier to inform the liberation. Even if, again, we are aware these quantitative estimates do not mean to fully drive the research um, allocation process, and there are other objectives to take into account of if, when allocating research funds, including the feasibility, acceptability of research, and also how much a research study could actually contribute to reduce uncertainty because these estimates assume that all uncertainty could be resolved. We know that's not the case in reality, and that may vary. Uh, how much research uh, could reduce uncertainty may vary across uh, study, but also across disease area, for instance. So it's just said that there are other parameters to, other considerations to take into account. All right, I stopped talking, and I stopped sharing my screen. <laughs> I know it's been rushed. I try to squeeze in so we don't go too much over. No, no, you've uh, done a great in. job. And, and I'm sure if we were physically anywhere, well, in, in where we're supposed to be in Zaragoza celebrating <laughs> this conference, we should all be clapping uh, because you did a really good job, uh, Leticia, and it's, it was very clear. And, and you say there's, there's a lot of um, uncertainty and assumptions and modeling or, you know, calculations in the tool, but... I think it's it, it's a good tool to help, as you say. I mean, it's not that you will make the decision just based yeah. on the tool, but yeah, it gives you evidence to 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 help you with your decision. I mean, being if I wanted to be a bit critical with my country, I would say in this country we're not even close to be using systematic cost effectiveness analysis. And I know it's a lot of people will start shouting at me if I say that, but still, um, I want to say. Uh, and, and this is the next step. Once you've done all the, the, the calculations and the modeling, you put them all together to try mm -hmm. to make sense of all the analysis that, you, that is out there published, whether independent, by HTA bodies, but at the end the literature, you know, is peer, I'm assuming 
the, the as you say, the, the numbers that go into the tool, the quality of them, you as researcher have to make the judgment calls to which ones you include and which ones you don't include for the calculation. So, but okay. So there was um, um, there was a question by Pilar, which I think Pilar Pinilla um, in more or less response in, you've got a response already from Leticia and some of her comments around that is um, very national specific. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Pilar, do you want to say, do you want to ask the question quickly? No, I think that she kind of covered it. I'm conscious of time. Do not worry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a question from Belen. Is there any experience of populating the tool using expert opinion rather than um, the literature? Um, no, but I mean, the tool, I have to say, is um, just launched. So. Um, no, but it can clearly, that's the whole thing, you can um, you can just enter that as well. So like a prior, like from some expert that can just give you more or less what they think as the standard error. And then you can uh, you can just launch the tool just using that. So you, you can really uh, use a mix. So you can use expert opinion, for instance, when you have just ISA information to say, okay, I just have an ISA. I need at least some information on either the cost or the incremental benefit. Could you maybe give us some ranges? And so you can put both information together or everything comes from expert opinion, for instance, in the form of standard error, the classic. So you could, just to go back to the question of Pilar that I see in the chat, um, is the idea that only studies relevant to the respective country are used. In the case of Malawi, if you think there were only one study that was Malawi based, so you definitely have to, in this case, in low middle income country, we use yeah, studies from other contexts. And that's why obviously, yeah, you need to take, to take into account whether um, it's relevant or not. And, oh, no. But this, yeah, this is not done by the tool. This is done by the end user when he decides whether to input that data in the tool. But it can be modified. You can think, oh, in that study, I think the cost will be low and just apply a lower cost. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, is there time for any more questions? Can I ask something quick? Uh, One Leticia, quick. yeah. I was thinking, how does this tool compare with the rapid models? You know, we are now testing the rapid models in the trials unit, which are the same kind of concepts here to prioritize all the research, you know, proposals we receive. The rabbit model is the one that was developed. So you were saying by uh, David, Claire, and so. Yeah. Okay. So th that's the model. So um, this is um, quite different. Is when you have no data at all. So you don't have sensitivity analysis from published cost effectiveness studies. That's you just um, and the way it, it looks at is to look at databases of um, basically of all the trials. But I think it's more relevant for really when you want information about clinical, uh, particular clinical effectiveness, but not so much for cost effectiveness. I mean, for, for what I gathered and I went back to the presentation, it's like if you want to get an idea of an effect size, for instance, an intervention that I have to reduce, uh, I don't know, uh, the risk of cardiovascular events, and then you go back to that database and you see, okay, how many and you look at all those interventions, past results, and you kind of synthesize that to get a prior. And based on that, then you can uh, use um, value of information analysis. Actually, you could use this information from that method into the tool. But that's, yeah, more, I think, for um, efficacy estimates and not so much for the overall cost effectiveness analysis. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Belen. Um, any final quick questions? I know we are two minutes over time and we need to finish, but any? No? Okay, well, again, please, please join, join me in, in, in thanking and congratulating Leticia for, for her great presentation. I'm pretty sure many of us will, at some point, will, will start looking and use and try to use it as well um because it looks really really interesting and you said it's, it's freely available to download um so with that i i close the i officially close close the session 
thanking Leticia, of course, and Anais and, and, and the organizers of, of the 50 XL session, uh, Jornadas. Just remembering tomorrow uh, there is the final session um, at four o'clock uh, on Thursday, tomorrow, um, which will close the, the Jornada SAES XL, uh, the virtual ones. And of course, as we all know and we all want, hopefully in 2022, we will have our XL plus one, uh, all, all presential, uh, with a bit of hugging, not a lot, and masks for sure, maybe or maybe not. Uh, but hopefully we'll be around uh, physically all together. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leticia, especially. And I hope you have a really nice evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Leticia. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.